Yeah, first of all, um, I'd like to thank the organizers. I feel honored uh, to be here and uh, represent the field of uh, linguistics at this, uh, at this conference. Yeah, so my title is Tracing the Major Indo-European Subgroups of, of Europe. Uh, yeah, of course, here we, here we have uh, the Indo-European languages. You probably have seen them before. Uh, as you can see, they spread over a huge uh, area at some point, uh, stretching two continents. So, yeah, you might think this is a nice map to look at, but for, us, actually, for linguists, it's, it's actually a problem. So it's, it's basically it's the stuff of nightmares, you could call it, because linguists, they would have to explain how these languages got where they are found and when uh, this happened. So we can't just watch at this map and uh, enjoy the scenery, and especially because since this language family stretch, uh, stretches such a huge area, um, something uh, quite uh, dramatic must have happened in prehistory. We can't just say, oh, the Indian European language family is, is, is a local development, uh, basically, in two different continents. So ideally, in an ideal world, you would have some very yeah, a, a grand narrative that can uh, give you some kind of explanation. Of course, this has been done, yeah, we could, uh, for just for now, we could uh, say, uh, let's just assume that uh, Maria Gimbutas was uh, right about uh, a lot of things. So, of course, she has this famous Kurgan theory with the, apparently, according to David Anthony, it's the last map in archaeology that still had uh, arrows, but, uh, and after that it became uh, illegal. No, that's not true, of course. But, yeah. She was also wrong about many things, such as the globular uh, emperor culture, as we know now. Uh, but yeah, let's just assume that the Kurgan, the, the, the expansion from the steppe, uh, is a, a possible ve vector for the spread of the language family on the whole. At least it seems it affected an area that was big enough to explain the movements of all of these languages. Of course, of course this didn't come out of the blue. Sometimes the, that it's, it's presented like that when you read the genetics papers. It, it basically, they make it seem like it's uh, her theory, but it, of course it's, it's not. It's a very old, uh, the step hypothesis is very old. So Schrader came up with it in the late 19th century. Then you have Hein, Müller, Child, Günther, Brandenstein, and Globe, and then only then you get to uh, Gimbutas, basically. Yeah, if you accept this uh, scenario, then the core of where is actually, yeah, you can't really ignore it. It it's, it's must have some significance for the spread of the European in the uh, in European languages because it's intermediate between the Yamnaya steppe culture and, and yeah, basically the uh, in European languages where you find them in their historical uh, location. So when you look, uh, when you read uh, Jim, Jim Mallory's uh, classic uh, In Search of the Indo-Europeans, he has this map, the corded where, and then he, he projects the, yeah, some in European languages on top of it and says, well, you know, where we find these languages, that's basically the area of the original corded ware. So maybe these languages actually all go back, back to the corded ware peoples. Well, of course, now we have some uh, genetic uh, substanti substantiation of this. So at least we know that population-wise, that corded ware at least uh, was affected by staff population. So that was very controversial, of course. Uh, but now we can actually, yeah, we know this and we can uh, move, uh, move on. Uh, so if in European was spoken on the step, it's very likely that it, yeah, also spread to the corded ware. But yeah, look, let's look at the details, you know. Does this actually work? Uh, because there's actually a lot of problems with uh, this scenario. Although, yeah, it has been suggested many times in the past as well. So if you read Günther, the Ursprung der Germanen, he says, die Germanen sind aus der Vermischung der nördlich äh, vordringenden Schnurkeramiker mit dem steinzeitlichen Bauernadel entstanden. I, know, I don't know if you remember this, but actually, yeah, Wolfgang really pay attention. <laughs> it's still in, in stock. So uh, these people, these linguists in the 30s, they actually already knew about these uh, Basically, this. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's very problematic actually when you look into the details. But because when, when do we have the first German, Germanic inscriptions? That's actually the first centuries 
AD, right? We have this very old, very spectacular new rune, a runic inscription from Norway found last year. It's the oldest one, but it's still from the yeah, period of AD, yeah, yeah. The, the historical period, basically. So there's a gap of at least two millennia between when you find Germanic in the, the written record and the corded ware. So what happened in those millennia, uh, you know, in between? You can't just say, oh, yeah, I don't, uh, I'll just assume that they were there and go home again. Well, there are some tools that you can make use of, so linguistic tools. So if you look at the Germanic language family, uh, the first inscriptions are from the first centuries uh, AD. So, and they diverged from the parent la language, Proto-Germanic. So this Proto-Germanic was spoken slightly earlier in the uh, last uh, half of the first millennium AD. So you can get a little bit uh, further back in the pa into the past by uh, simply looking at the uh, phylogeny of Germanic. But you can also invoke uh, language context. So you can, there are actually some loan words from Celtic into Germanic. Uh, it happened in prehistory. So Germanic famously borrowed the word for iron from, from Celtic. Uh, so this you can use to basically delimit Germanic in space and time. You can say, OK, uh, iron, Proto-Germanic was an Iron Age, age language. So it, not Bronze Age. It has to have been in the Iron Age. And it was in contact with Celtic, which was probably further south because we know that the Celtic languages later emerge in the south. There's also a later layer, an earlier layer of Celtic loans. Um, they have to do with the social um, um, practices. So you get a word for a ruler, a word for a jester, a word for a leech. It's very, like, has a very petty kingdom-like feel or something, some kind of very small uh, court where there was this very, not very important king, but he, at least he had uh, a jester and, and, and leech, a doctor, or something like that. Uh, and the Germanic uh, speakers, they adopted this from an early form of Celtic, somewhere around, well, yeah, 1000 BC. And we can, uh, if you look at the details, you can zoom in uh, onto this process. Something very uh, dramatic actually happened between the later, the, f the first Celtic loans and the later loans, and it's called this some Germanic sounds shift. So you get P, F becoming F, T becoming Th, and K becoming H. So the whole phonology of Germanic was uh, transformed. It's a change from an, an basically an Indo European dialect to a very different language. Uh, and this is how you define the difference between pre Germanic and proto Germanic. Child commented on this, is, uh, not, not many people know this nowadays, but he said, yeah, he basically, uh, I don't know. Yeah, he said, Germanic is uh, manifestly degenerate from a phonetic standpoint, so he was obviously not very impressed uh, by <laughs> Germanic. Yeah, you can actually also look at uh, another language family, Uralic, which also exists in Europe, in the north. Uh, because Germanic it donated a lot of words to Finnic. So the word for king, Germanic word for king, it was adopted by Finnic speakers uh, somewhere also uh, in the probably Iron Age. So you can say, yeah, so Germanic was in contact with Celtic, but also with Finnic in the north. There's the one, this one later, uh, er, later layer, but there's a, another earlier layer that happened before Germanic basically became degenerate. Uh, and yeah, that's we have several words uh, we find, uh, and one of them is the word for hoof uh, that was borrowed into Finnic. So you can really somehow in this way you can delimit the Proto-Germanic speech community, as you say, in, in, in time and space. Yeah. So what does this mean when you look at the archaeology? Yeah. Well, uh, Germanic and pre-Germanic they probably existed. Uh, yeah, in the late Bronze Age to the uh, Iron Age then yeah, you need to find some kind of cultural context that fits that. Well, uh, since it was spoken between Celtic and Finnic, it must have been somewhere in nor Northern Europe uh, between those groups. And then you yeah, is, yeah, usually, usually end up in somewhere in Scandinavia. Uh, of course, we don't really want to go back to the, you know, the phase where we say uh, the uh, Germanic was the language of the Yastor of culture or something like that. Of course, we can't really do that. So uh, nowadays we uh, tend to say, just Jastorf culture was a, a likely source of a proto-Germanic uh, culture or something like that. There must, may have been lots of other languages in, these, uh, in this area and in this period, but uh, Germanic must, must at least have been part of, of, of this cultural setting. 
Yeah, so we can kind of, with the linguistic evidence, we can get uh, to the Late Bronze Age. Basically, we can say that Germanic was present in North Europe in the Late Bronze Age, probably. But yeah, then we're still not really where we need to be, right? Because the core where is still so much earlier. So we're still lacking at least a millennium. Uh, and then things get really difficult. Uh, of course, because there's multiple demographic pulses that arrive in, uh, in the north with step ancestry. So of course we have the corded wear, but the corded wear isn't just uh, a single entity, so uh, as Martin has uh, emphasized. So uh, of course, when you look at the, there's a pulse coming from the east, the battle axe culture, and then, then there's a southern pulse uh, with a single grave culture. So these actually, genetically, we now know that these are uh, different demographic uh, vectors. Uh, then uh, there is also the beaker, so Prescott in uh, 2017, article here says, well, Germanic it might actually have come to Scandinavia with, with the bell beakers that, you know, settled in, in Jutland and, and Norway in the late uh, Neolithic. So that's actually three uh, different vectors already that could have, you know, transferred Germanic into the north. And there's another one, because when you look at the haplogroups, there's, uh, well, usually R1A is associated with the corded wear derived peoples and then R1B with the bell beaker derived peoples. Uh, but actually, when you look at the modern Scandinavia, there's another haplogroup that's dominant. It's I, I, I1, a slightly obscure haplogroup, probably uh, derived from uh, Neolithic farmers. And we don't really, don't yet know where it actually it originates, but it's very dominant in, in Scandinavia nowadays. And also, when you look at the uh, migration period movements of Germanic uh, groups, then you see that they all have this. So it's actually a, quite a likely uh, marker of the Germanic speech community. So, in conclusion, for Germanic alone, we have four different uh, population vectors that could have introduced Germanic to, to the north, and we don't really know which one is the correct one. Similar problems, they uh, also exist with the other in European languages. So when we look at uh, Baltic Slavic, for instance, uh, yeah, when you, uh, the, Baltic, the Baltic languages are nowadays spoken in uh, yeah, Lithuania and, uh, and Latvia. Um, step ancestry arrives there very early. You also get some genomes that are uh, completely, that are pure Yamnaya basically. So there's a huge Yamnaya impact in that area in the early third millennium BC. So yeah, and then you can say, well, Mallory was right. So Baltic, yeah, it does, it does belong to this. Uh, it was introduced by you know, corded wear, really corded wear, people. But yeah, when you look at the linguistics, so actually, yeah, Slavic and Baltic, they go together, uh, they, they form a subnote, but it's not very old. So the common ancestor, linguistic ancestor of Baltic and Slavic, it probably dates back to 1500 BC. So we can't really go further back. Before that, there was no Baltic or Slavic. So there, it, it really doesn't make any sense to say uh, Baltic was introduced by the court is where uh, people, at least not the initial wave, that's simply anachronistic, doesn't work. Also, we know from the toponyms that actually Baltic uh, isn't actually a Baltic language. So but the Baltic languages, they arrived in the Baltic very recently. So uh, the toponyms show that they moved from the east, actually, from an area close to Moscow. And they only moved to the Baltic fairly late, maybe as late as the Iron Age. So whoever arrived in the Baltic with the corded wear, they were definitely, they had nothing to do with uh, Baltic. You might think this is complicated, but then we get to Celtic, is one of the most vexed uh, questions, linguistic questions in, uh, in European prehistory. We talked about it a lot. So there's various uh, homeland hypotheses, and too many. These are just, uh, yeah, it's just a selection. Of course, we have the, the old uh, bell beaker uh, hypothesis by child, uh, so that Celtic was introduced by the bell beakers. And there's another one, the Hallstatt Lab 10 vector. But yeah, archaeologists don't really see uh, people coming with that. Then we have a uh, homeland in southern France. Then we have a homeland in the west, basically, in, in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that was a hypothesis uh, proposed by Barry Cunliffe and John Koch. Uh, and then recently we have Celtic from the center. I don't know where that is, to be honest. But yeah, so it, it, it's actually very, very difficult. 
Uh, and then, um, of course, the debate has focused mainly about the entry of Celtic to Britain. Britain is actually peripheral to the Celtic, uh, original Celtic homeland, but it's the only place where Celtic languages still persist today, so that's why there's a lot of focus on, on this. Uh, yeah, we know now genetically that there was a big bell beaker uh, demographic impact. Uh, if you look at the yeah, shift in the ancestry, it seems highly unlikely that it didn't impact the linguistic con configuration of Britain. Something dramatic appears to have happened, and I fail to see how that would not have had any lasting effect on the linguistic landscape. But whether, whether Celtic was introduced with that way, well, we don't know. Uh, Sims Williams, he says it could have been another Indo-European language that we don't know about and that was su superseded by Celtic later. Because Patterson et al., as we all know nowadays, they showed that there was a later population movement from France, or maybe some more like a diffusion. Uh, so they suggested maybe this is possibly the vector that brought Celtic to, to Britain. Then, then we have Ireland, which is even more uh, problematic. So genetically, yeah, Cassidy and Bradley, they, uh, they write that there, was, there are no major genetic changes after the Bellbeaker period. So if, if Celtic was right, if there's anything that could have brought Celtic to Ireland, it, could have, it should have been uh, the Bellbeakers. And uh, within linguistics, of course, we have uh, Cunliffe and, and Koch that agree to that. But there's other linguists and that have a completely different interpretation. So uh, Celtologists, they frequently assume that Celtic arrived in Ireland in the late Iron Age. So there's basically a two millennium uh, gap between those interpretations. <laughs> so what to do with that? Yeah, archaeology, in archaeology, we have recently O'Brien, he suggested also there was archaeologically, uh, the bell beakers might have actually been, uh, yeah, might have introduced a cultural, cultural change that's significant enough to have introduced Celtic, but yeah, he's rather agnostic, to be honest. Uh, and we have recently James Mallory that has this very different, or this new idea that it's arrived with, maybe with the hill forts, to late, middle to late Bronze Age hill fort and sword warfare. Of course, this kind of echoes the Patterson paper, right? It's actually contemporaneous with the, yeah, the, the, the late Bronze Age uh, demographic impact. Uh, from France. But genetically, we don't know. There is no, so far no evidence that can support this. But if Mallory is right, then definitely uh, it's still possible that if, if, if this wave, Bronze Age wave, brought Celtic to the British Isles, then there might have been a previously, previous Indian European language in the British Isles that was not Celtic, but potentially uh, in the European. Okay, we talked about Bulgarian. Italic, finally, I'm going to skip Sklavic because there is, well, it's in, uh, it's too far to the east anyway. <laughs> Italic is actually also a very complex linguistically, as, as we know. It's probably one of the most complex uh, areas, uh, at least that we know of uh, when uh, the dawn of uh, history. So we have uh, various in European languages. Uh, we have Italic languages, Celtic languages, but also some other in European groups, such as uh, Venetic and, and Mesopic. So it's, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, yeah, to basically project this onto a step ancestry or something. That's a big problem. Uh, actually, linguistically, it was also problematic. Uh, people they had a hard time actually uh, delimiting Proto-Italic proto in space and time. We, uh, there's a lot of disagreement about when Proto-Celtic split up, when it started and when it ended, and split up into the daughter languages, so the Latin and, and Sibelic. We now think that there, is, there are some arguments that we can use to actually date Proto-Celtic because, they, again, they have a word for iron, so it must have been, an, 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 yeah, it's, it's not really rocket science. If, if a speech community has a word for iron, then they must have... Uh, probably existed in the, the Iron Age and not in a period where there was no iron, iron metallurgy. Um, and we have the word for no, iron, uh, ferrum in, in Latin, which dates back to the Proto-Italic period, period. And it's very reminiscent of um, other words in uh, Anatolian languages, so, such as Luwian and, and Swan, which is a, a Caucasian uh, language. 
So it seems that this word actually spread from uh, Anatolia to the Italian uh, peninsula uh, at the beginning of the Iron Age. And then you can, it might have actually moved simply with the spread of this, uh, this top technology from, from the East Mediterranean to the Central Mediterranean. If that's correct, then we can actually uh, yeah, date Proto-Italic to, well, the period after to 1200 BC or something. But again, yeah, that's, that's a lot of, there's still a lot of, uh, there's a, a huge time gap between that and the Cordovar culture. Uh, we do get uh, steppe ancestry uh, relatively uh, uh, late in central, central Italy. It arrives around 1600 uh, BC. So yeah, it, it's quite close to the Proto-Italic uh, period. So you, it, it's a potential mesh. This could have brought the Italic to Italy. But then again, we have all of these other uh, languages, in European languages. That's, so why would, we, why would we cherry pick Italic and not, for instance, Mesopic or, or, or Venetic? It's, it's, yeah, we can't really tell at this moment. What we do see is that we get these R1B haplogroups, that's so they it shows an affiliation, affinity with the, more, probably with the bell beaker uh, populations rather than with the Cordovar uh, populations. So uh, if we would have to choose, then we would probably uh, put our bets on the, the, the bell beakers uh, and not the Cordovar as in Jim Mallory's original proposal. Yeah, but if step, 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 step ancestry did arrive in Italy and if it actually did introduce uh, it, Italic around uh, maybe 1600 BC or slightly earlier, where did it come from? Well, we don't really know. It did it come from the West? Uh, maybe, but there's only very minor step admixture in the early beaker contexts. So is this enough to actually introduce a language? It seems a bit doubtful. To did it uh, spread from the east? Well, maybe, but it's also very difficult to substantiate. We have some uh, theories. So we have the collapse of the Terramara cultures, uh, which is actually ends uh, right about when uh, Proto-Italic ends. So the collapse of the Terramara culture is basically syn synchronic, uh, synchronous with the collapse of or the disintegration of uh, Proto-Italic. So maybe this uh, could be a potential match between the archaeology and the linguistic. But still, yeah, we can't really prove uh, it. Um, maybe um, there's a talk, there's a lot of, um, some evidence that Tamara populations were impacted by tell cultures. Christian, Chris Jensen has proposed that this was a potential vector from, uh, for Italic into the Tamara culture. Uh, and then you can potentially trace it further back to the local uh, bell beaker populations, subpopulations in, in uh, hung Hungary. But this is all still very, uh, yeah, theoretical and uh, speculative. So uh, I, if, if you, the only way, way to, to prove this would be to ask a geneticist to look at the IBD sharing, uh, uh, do an IBD sharing analysis, but uh, I'm not sure there's enough uh, data at the moment. Yeah, so what is the picture? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's likely that if you look at Italic and, 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 and Celtic, that it's possible that they actually uh, go back to a, a, a layer of post-Indo-European uh, subclade. It's, within linguistics, it's known as Italo-Celtic. That in turn uh, yeah, belonged or existed within the bell beaker uh, horizon. We can also connect Venetic to that. Uh, in, in, in the north, we have Germanic and Balto-Slavic. Uh, yeah, they have sometimes also been uh, unified into a later a third millennium uh, subclade known as germana uh, And it's possible that this speech community existed somewhere uh, in the Cordovera uh, horizon, but we don't know uh, where. There are some linguistic evidence for this uh, dichotomy. So in, in germana Slavic, we get a dative plural ending in M, whereas in the italic language, we get a dative plural in, in B. So these are the nitty gritty uh, linguistic details it seems to indicate some kind of uh, split between those groups, early split. Yeah, so then you can say maybe Italo Celtic was some kind of a R R1 B ish or R1 e R1 B ish, you could say, and maybe uh, Germano Bolto Slavic uh, was actually a corded, uh, corded wire dialect. 
conclusions. So there are very long time gaps within the Yamnaya expansion and the historical Indo-European uh, languages. It's a huge problem. So even with the genetics showing that the Yamnaya is a potential vector for the spread of the Indo-European language family on the whole, it really doesn't tell us how the individual languages ended up in the, their historical locations. So linking the actual languages to the third millennium instead of derived cultural compasses is still challenging. Uh, even the, the bell beaker and the cordware culture, they, yeah, we know simply too little about the subpopulations to be able to link them to, the, to any specific languages. What we, do, what we can say is that the cordware is an unlikely vector for the whole set of the Indo-European uh, languages in Europe. So uh, actually when you read Jim Elroy's book, In Search of the Indo-Europeans, again, he talks a lot about cordware, uh, but he mentions the, the bell beaker culture only once. I was actually quite shocked to find out about that. It, it occurs one, only a single time in the whole book. Uh, so there seems to have been, uh, yeah, he seems to have un underemphasized the influence of the bell beaker culture. So it does seem like the, the bell beaker culture with all the step ancestry that we now know it has uh, was some kind of a vector uh, also, not for all of the European languages of Europe, but maybe for Italic and Celtic. Yeah, Germanic and Baltic Slavic, again, they may have been mediated by cordware subpopulations, but it's unclear which subpopulations. And then, yeah, there's a kind of a humbling, uh, uh, shall I say, conclusion. So, there were likely uh, many unknown in European dialects in the third millennium uh, of e Europe that were superseded seeded by uh, in European languages we do know. So uh, we've seen in Germanic, uh, for Germanic and Celtic and Baltic, uh, that the earliest step groups that arrived in the uh, in the area where later these languages are spoken, uh, that they are not good vectors for these languages. So they must have been brought there by later. Uh, Subpopulations sub in the in the Bronze Age probably. So the, the Bronze Age Bronze Age is, is basically a, a big gap still, a big challenge. A little bit of self uh, promotion. So uh, if you're interested in stuff like this, so there's next uh, week uh, there is a conference. The, my one of my PhDs is defending his dissertation, and there's a small conference where you also talk about stuff like this. Uh, Peter Schreiber, he will talk about the possible Indo-European substrate in insular Celtic. So he, he thinks maybe that there is evidence for uh, uh, yeah, a pre-Celtic Indo-European language in, in Britain. Thank you very much. That was it.